These three studies reveal some important factors that we need to consider when trying to find the ideal waters for bass, and especially when we're looking for bigger bass. We will cover some interesting facts on forage size, types of forage, how much forage is needed for bass to grow, and something really interesting I found on water clarity. Links to all these documents are below. First, let's talk about forage size, or more importantly, should I say forage shape. When we hear the phrase big baits for big bass, we often think about the length of the bait. I mean, look at all these swim baits on the market. They have some pretty good length to them. Or when we're talking about the heat of the summer, throwing great big 10, 12, 14 inch worms for bass. Well, this study said the following. They, the bass, swallow live fish and other aquatic life whole rather than biting off chunks, which limits the size of what they can eat. Depth of the body of the prey must be less than the mouth width of the bass. As a general rule, the larger the bass, the larger the prey that will be selected. Very large bass usually will not prey heavily on small fish. Well, here's what the study is saying, and one of the others match this exactly. They're saying that the prey species from top to bottom, from the dorsal fin down to the belly, actually is or may be more important than the length of the prey species. Have you ever caught a little 12 inch bass on something like a big 300 jerk bait and you're thinking, man, what was this little dude thinking? Well, his instincts may have been telling him that the width of that prey, he could get it into his mouth and was more concerned about that than the length. It's pretty interesting. So what would be our takeaway here? Well, if you're ever out on the water and you're having one of those days where you're just catching lots and lots of 10 and 12 inch fish, you just can't seem to shake that smaller bite. Well, instead of thinking of a larger bait as far as in length, maybe we need to think about that larger bait as in depth from top to bottom. And if that smaller bass cannot get that bait in the width of their mouth, they probably aren't gonna hit it. Well, let's move on to number two, the type of forage. We all know that bass will eat just about anything, but here's what I learned. Largemouth bass will eat a variety of live fish, but bluegill are particularly important in both ponds and small lakes because they reproduce throughout the warm months. This furnishes a continual supply of different forage sizes. In other words, because panfish will spawn throughout the summer, there's always bigger prey species and smaller prey species available. And I know that this study referred to ponds and small lakes, but boy, I would think this would apply to just about any body of water. And so this means as far as bass are concerned that the smaller bass can find calorie rich prey all throughout those warmer months. And of course, the bigger bass can eat the bigger panfish. This matches perfectly with what I was seeing late last summer and early fall when I ran across a bunch of bass and catfish feeding on very young panfish. We have to freeze frame the footage right here to actually pick out these small bluegills. And there were bass all over the place and more coming into frame all the time. And they had no problem rooting around down in this vegetation to drive those tiny panfish out and then gobble them up. And we've talked about this before and I've shown this footage before, but it really lines up with what these studies were showing. And hey, quick reminder, my Bass Behavior Bundle comes out March 15th. You can sign up down below to get on the waiting list. Thank you. Well, let's move on to number three. And this really explains that earlier fact I was talking about that the study said that big bass really don't want to feed heavily on small fish. And it also explains why we can get a lot of bites from small bass. It takes roughly 10 pounds of consumed forage to gain one pound in weight. Now, there are some other studies that said eight pounds, well, whether it's eight pounds or 10 pounds, doesn't matter. That is a lot of prey to consume, especially if you think about something like a small little fathead minnow. I don't even know how many of those it would take to make up 10 pounds, but it's a lot. Big bass would have to eat a whole lot of them to get to that 10 pound magic number to gain a pound of weight. 
And being that smaller bass cannot ingest big prey, this explains that they've got to eat a lot of those tiny little bait fish to hit that 10 pound mark, which would make sense considering they seem to hit our baits, especially smaller baits, all the time. Now what about something like a threadfin shad? So that's the smaller of the very common shad species between gizzard shad and threadfin. When big bass get to feeding on a ball of threadfin shad, the opportunity, because those shad are packed together so tightly, is really good to consume a lot of calories based on the effort that they're putting in, especially if they can pin that ball of shad up against something hard like the shoreline or even up on the surface and, and pin them up there. So that would be why threadfin shad, when they're in those big balls, big groups, that big bass can really get a lot of bang for their buck or consume a lot of calories for the energy that they expend. Now on to number four, and I found this one really interesting, basically, couple of these studies were talking about that the water clarity in that two to four foot range is ideal. They're saying in really muddy water, bass have a hard time feeding or a harder time feeding because they're very sight oriented predators. Well, what these studies were talking about in this ideal range of visibility or ideal clarity really lines up with something that I filmed last year. So some of you may remember I did a video on what bass do after a heavy rain and this one particular pocket really clouded up. This lake is normally crystal clear. Well I couldn't find any life whatsoever in the clear water that bumped up next to or was bordering this cloudy water pocket. Seemed like everything moved into it and there were species of all kinds of fish in here in a very tight, densely packed area. Well, this really lines up with what the study said. Now, this cloudiness was caused by rain. It was not caused by, let's say, really good nutrients in the water. So that part of it is a little bit different. But as far as the bass and what they could see, it was probably that two to four foot range. And then a lot of you that watched that video talked about, you know, I wonder if that cloudy water, um, especially for bass that are used to clear water, it made them feel like they were in some sort of cover. They felt more protected, uh, more hidden, but yet they could still see. Well, super interesting, and so many of us have water clarities that we feel comfortable fishing. Like, we'll get out on a body of water, especially a big reservoir, and look for that water clarity that we prefer. Well, maybe instead of looking for our favorite water clarity, we need to be thinking about that ideal water clarity for these predators. And hey, if you want to watch a video that talks about a jig trailer that so many anglers are just raving about, go ahead and check this one out right here. And make sure that you go out and encourage someone today. You never know how you might just change their life. For The Bass Fishing Life, I'm your host, Steve Rogers.